startuprad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Joe from startuprad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany. I'm right now here, as you can see, if you're watching this on YouTube in my little bit cramped study, and I do have, of course, a guest again for you. Today, I do welcome Peril here in my podcast. Hey, welcome. Hi, Dean. I'm good. How are you doing, Joe, today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Um, I've been stalking you a little bit on LinkedIn, as I do with all of my guests, everybody who would like to reach out to you directly you can go down here in the show notes there'll be a link to your linkedin profile um that said you are living a very interesting life i would say is it possible that this is true so uh i can say you have been in india in the us and you're based right now in germany how did this happen? Well, as you can see, I am an Indian. <laughs> so I was born and brought up there. I educated there and I also worked there. And my work actually uh, gave me opportunities to travel world. So I happened to travel all across the world, wherever I could go with my job. And I ended up living in Germany because it's closer to US and closer to India. And it's pretty central on the globe and uh, Germans really welcomed me. So yeah, I decided to be here in Cologne. Ah, Cologne, it's, it's also interesting because if you are from India, if you're thinking about, yeah, let's let's do the two time zones, India and the US, it's, it's more frequently that you're actually thinking about, for example, the UK, especially London. Why did you settle on Germany and uh, especially Cologne here. And after you've answered that, we'll poke a little bit around your CV. Yeah. So it's it's a funny question and a very interesting story. So you'll hear a lot of stories from me, Jorn, if you go back uh, in my life. So what happened that time was, uh, it was turn of century. I used to work for Ericsson HP. And I, like I mentioned, I used to travel a lot. And interestingly, my husband was in a job, which also meant a lot of traveling. And through his job, he got a mandate that he was supposed to set up an office here in Europe from his company. That time he was working for Dell Perro Systems. And uh, it was mainland Europe, not in UK, in London. They already had an office there. So he was looking to set it up in Germany, somewhere in Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Dak region, pretty much. And because my, um, I had some connections here and uh, because as a family, when we decided to move here in Europe, so I got an option to work here as a functional head in German telco that time. And we ended up in Cologne. So that's pretty much it. Ah, I see, I see. For everybody who's not from Germany or German speaking, we may add that Dach region actually means D for Deutschland, Germany, Austria and Switzerland, so it's basically the German-speaking area. And Liechtenstein is so small, we don't even take the acronym in there. That said, you, uh, what, what did you actually do because before you became an entrepreneur? We heard you've you've been working with uh, well-known companies at the time. How long did you work there, and what happened that you became an entrepreneur? So I, like I mentioned, so I pretty much mentioned uh, Ericsson HP, German Telecom. And so that my corporate experience was about, I, I guess, about 10, 10 years plus, 10, 11 years. And then um, I became a mother. So as young parents, my husband had actually set up his business and uh, we decided as a family to move back to India after the birth of our child and because we were having these kind of traveling jobs and with a small kid and uh, we decided to be together as a family and uh, not travel around so I quit my job and we both decided to move back to India and at that time where we have a house in Delhi so all the companies uh, had moved outside of the main Delhi so either I would be traveling uh, in direction of east or west of Delhi 
two hours per day. And uh, being in the middle management meant I would be traveling domestically as well internationally. So I decided, what the heck, I'm going to go my own. I converted the basement of my house uh, one third as the office and two thirds as a play area, hired another nanny, which was easier and affordable to do in Delhi and called my network. And I said, well, guys, I'm going my own. (laughs) And it was a telco based uh, startup, so to speak, in today's uh, days and time uh, terminology. So that's how my startup journey as an entrepreneur started in the summer of 2007. I see, I see. And you uh, you obviously skipped the part where you worked for a cable provider. The service for the German cable providers is not as bad as in the US, but I do believe Germany is catching up there. Um, been at that point back in 2007, you've been a mother, you've been in Delhi, and you started being an entrepreneur. Okay, and now we have Just to make the tiny switch from a basement in Delhi to Cologne, how did that happen? So, like I said, so it was starting, happened in 2007 and uh, the business uh, was growing and uh, I obviously uh, expanded from my basement over a couple of times. So that means I did something right there. And then I was traveling. What a surprise after a few years uh, when you have a business and you have international customers, you have to travel and the travel grew <laughs> over a period of time. And then it was a time when the child had to go to school and uh, again, a family business combination uh, in decision making. And uh, we decided to move back to Germany because uh, my husband's business was an automotive and aerospace in which I had invested in. And uh, my business was predominantly around telco and IT services with customers expanding right from Europe to Asia to US. Again, uh, new, new, knowing Cologne as a city and uh, we always had ties here. We always kind of came back every summer here to meet our friends. Uh, so yeah, it was an obvious choice if you're moving out. So we'll kind of move back to Cologne. And ended up uh, moving here in 2011, end of 2011. We may add that I've been also living in Cologne for project something like approximately a year. Admittedly, Cologne has some very nice looking places and some very bad looking places. A friend of mine who's living there for decades now, he says um, Cologne is more... Um, a feeling of living than actually a beautiful city. Would you agree to that? I guess so. If you compare certain parts of uh, Dusseldorf and Bonn, so yes, we do have uh, ugly spots. <laughs> But uh, yes, it is definitely the energy in the city. You know, when we first came here, we moved from Delhi, right? So Delhi is a big city wasn't as populated 20 years ago as it is now, but it was still a big city and still populated. And compared to Bonn, where we first went, we found that as a sleepy town. And at the age uh, where we were in, we decided to move to Cologne, which seemed more familiar and livelier. Of course, Dusseldorf was still rebuilding at that time. Uh, I, we may add for everybody who's not too familiar with German history, Bonn used to be the capital of Germany. It is actually so small that it was sometimes called uh, the capital town of Germany. Um, I know what you're saying there, but it's obviously also a very beautiful city at the River Rhine. So now we are with, 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 a, with a little stop in Bonn, we ended up in Cologne. What did you do there? So like I mentioned, so I uh, got a job at German Telecom. So German Telecom was going through deregulation process at that time, which you rightly pointed earlier on, briefly mentioned upon. And then I became the functional head for one of the cable assets here, which was Kabel NRV at that time, which got rebranded to E, uh, NRV, GmbH, then rebranded to Unity. And now what a life has come full circle. It has been sold to the competitor, Vodafone. So that's that's how it all happened. Admittedly, um, I, we we tend to bash a little bit the cable companies here, but this recording is also done via a uh, Vodafone. They're not sponsoring this podcast, but if anybody from uh, from Vodafone is listening to this podcast, you know how to reach me, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I like the color of your jersey. It's uh, kind of going in that direction too. Well, I, I I'm actually wearing it because it's 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 like a little bit fall color. And right now, when you look outside, uh, we're recording this on October 6th. So outside, it's it's getting a little bit darker, a little bit more rainy. But I actually like that. It's it's the best time of the year for peppermint tea. Mm, yes. Um. Okay, and then uh, from being a functional head of a cable company, which at one point ended up uh, being owned by Vodafone, um, when did you take the step to be like an entrepreneur again? So, um, so like I said, so I was the head of IT. That was way back uh, when I joined and I quit in 2007. And I went on my journey from 2007 onwards as an entrepreneur and on the journey, built many businesses, uh, not only in telcos, but then also in ed education technologies and uh, mobile gaming and stuff like that. Before I exited out of the businesses and from 2015 onwards, I was predominantly investing in startups uh, as angel, business angel. And that goes for both me and my husband. Uh, we both were doing that. And uh, at some point in time, um, doing uh, these investments and analyzing different uh, use cases as we were receiving these investment cases, we realized they were like there is a problem in industry in general in venture capital and risk investments. And we decided to turn that uh, concept into reality. And we are very passionate about it. And that's when we launched Dudash earlier this year. And that is a problem of information asymmetry is what we want to solve as part of our uh, venture with Udash Capital Networks. Mm, we may tell our audience here that I've been one of the first few hundred um, members of Udash because you guys uh, sought me out and I joined. And you can also be a member of my group at Dudash where you can actually help, for example, to formulate questions for startups or help me select startups there. It's it's not a free group. It's a paid for group. But nonetheless, you will find the link down here in the show notes. That said, because you're actually not only it's not only an investment platform, it has characteristics of a social network as well, right? Yeah, so as our go to market, you're right, Yon. So we basically flipped our go to market strategy. We have first launched the community network, especially in the COVID times when we had to launch, and our product is still under build at the moment. And we are looking at Q1 next year where, where we'll be launching the first version of our product in the market. So community is more like uh, getting people together and also helping the early stage founders who are predominantly looking for education and uh, network. And uh, as they kind of go through their idea validation, they're looking for product build and other ecosystem players help. So pitching help and other other things like financial documents and stuff like that. So we have a huge network now. Uh, we launched early May. We have more than 1,800 people. We're close to 1,900 actually now on the platform, growing on its own predominantly through recommendation. And we are present across 81 countries by now. And uh, of course, there are verticals right from, uh, you know, uh, any any uh, uh, you can take right from financial services or health care or augmented reality, tourism, gaming, uh, education technology. So there are different verticals which are represented on the platform, even aerospace. <laughs> Ag Agri tech is also there. So there are a lot of uh, people who are there on the platform. It's pretty vibrant. And we have uh, really early stage startups to startups which are at late uh, seed uh, series a and we also have investors there who are angels uh, to really uh, large funds so it's represented across uh, by variety of people even in a small numbers that we have in the community it's very very focused and uh, very very uh, kind of uh, yeah startup oriented Hmm, I see. Um, we have been going through the network. Actually, you have some very specific hubs where you have groups for certain cities, right? Yeah. So it's it's very interesting you touch upon that. So after we launched, we didn't even think about it. Like a lot of people reached out to us and they said we want to 
also launched this community in our own uh, cities and we said okay let's think about it let's do it in a proper way so we as a team we are four uh, founders and we basically came together and we brainstormed and we came up with the concept of uh, city leaders uh, as we call them ambassadors they are our ambassadors judash ambassadors in individual cities and uh, with covid at that time we call them as sparring ring leaders and uh, we we are present across 16 cities right now we uh, you know we have an we have a four week uh, masterclass program which we basically help them to have a structure around the whole thing and uh, it's it's progressing pretty well it's it's going pretty well so far we have a really good representation with these people across we are very thankful to them Sounds good. Um, where is currently like your your, your biggest uh, city groups? Where is your kind of hot spot right now? Yeah, so there are like lots of hot spots. So of course, India being one of the very populated country, <laughs> so the quite a few cities are represented uh, within India. Then we are also present in Middle East. and uh, which is dubai abu dhabi this region and uh, in saudi arabia as well we we have a chapter there as well and growing quite steadily in south africa cape town and uh, we are also present in israel actually so i, w- I was very happy when the uh, you know this uh, abrahamic accord was signed up so we were present both in dubai and tel aviv so it was really great to hear that that the operation can take place even in a in a much larger context now in a much better way. Mm, I see, see. Uh let's get a little bit back to um how this came about because you and your husband have been investing in startups and there was an issue. Can you kind of take us on your train of thought what was like um the way leading up to uh starting Dodash and especially the moment um when you thought, mm, let's do it that way um how how did this happen how did you actually because that is something you don't think about uh you get up one morning oh i'll launch an investment network for early stage startups that, that that's not what usually happens right so um basically what was your train of thought how did this story build up yeah Yeah every success story has like 10 years of midnight uh, oil burning so we we have about 2 years plus now <laughs> not 10 years so uh, the way it happened was like like i mentioned we've been investing in startups for a while now and we've been analyzing the business cases and the propositions as they were coming uh, along our way so we invest directly and also we are lps with uh, one of the funds based in us and uh, we receive different types of information whenever uh, we are investing in any any startup and every startup has their own journey their own uh, you know definition of a problem solution business model or how they want to solve a specific problem their approach to the whole thing so there was no way to kind of have a standardized method so to speak to analyze the market and there is a lot of research that needs to be done to analyze the investment opportunity i would say personally i learned a lot because i got to know about shoe businesses i got to know about uh, different markets which i never thought about could potentially grow and happen so so these are some side uh, benefits uh, other than just purely investing and uh, <laughs> talking about the benefits of risk capital in the long term then we thought of creating let's say a checklist or uh, standardizing the process between just me and my husband right our family office is just we both right where we invest and uh, how 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 can we streamline this and this is where we were and we were talking to other friends uh, who are also angel investors and uh, how do they go about it and they came up with their own set of problems and then because we also invest through a fund and we ask them how do you go about it so you know it was like one thing led to another and then it became like a challenge that we should solve this challenge and we ended up talking to a lot of founders and a lot of investors and a lot of funds and we realized oh my god this is genuinely a problem which needs to be addressed and um, as part of our giving back we were also running an accelerator program here locally uh, to you know invigorate the startup community here in cologne for the last few years so with that effect we launched founder institute here in cologne and uh, we kind of funded it through the first uh, part uh, so it successfully two programs have been concluded 
And there again, right from idea stage to some uh, startups who have raised some funding, we found there is uh, there is a lot of information asymmetry that is there. And there is inconsistency and incoherence in, in information that either founder shares. Uh, and it's not necessarily they're doing it on purpose. They just don't know which information needs to be provided at what time, what should be the frequency, and how that information should be updated. Or even if I have to, let's say, prepare a financial plan, is there a template for that? There does, there is no template for that. If there is a startup which needs to be valued, there is a valuation that should be done. So how I value a startup versus how you will value, perhaps it could be different valuation. And also the parameters and the dynamics of a particular industry or a particular market could be different. So there are a lot of uh, variables and a lot of data points that need to go into it. And uh, my background is predominantly data. And uh, so that's where I see there is a lot of data that can be collected and we can uh, try to solve this problem by connecting the dots and creating certain models, uh, data models and knowledge graphs and creating uh, some kind of, you know, encoders going forward with which we can solve this problem. And inherently, a lot of decisions that investors do are also biased in some form or the other. And, and you must have, you know, you, you can validate that you're pretty much, uh, you know, aware of this in the industry. We know that uh, a certain <laughs> most of the investments go to men and they also say it's white men and female founders get very few investments. The founders of color get uh, very, very little investment. So through this process, we should be able to remove that cognitive bias in the long run. That is also a intrinsic motivation that we have that the investment should reach to the people who really deserve it make this process efficient, make this process transparent. And with COVID, we have seen that fundraising can happen over Zoom or <laughs> Skype calls. So hopefully that that can just accelerate uh, going forward. You actually make me smile when you've been talking about the story of Dudash because usually a, a startup, an entrepreneur starts with one problem, but apparently you had a whole list of problems, which which was quite interesting for me. Um, since you're one of the, in, also an investor I have now in the interview, and we're talking about investment, investability, investment readiness of startups. Um is there like a rule of thumb how much information a startup should provide? Because when I see a lot of pitch decks, when I help them to figure out what they're doing, where, uh, where they find investors, that's usually a problem for startups. Either they don't provide a lot of information or they provide way too much information so the important bits and pieces get covered somewhere uh in all the the the, the ocean of information what what is your like rule of thumb your thoughts about that yeah i think a whole you know when you're having a conversation and if you and i meet for the first time and it could be either ways right either i'm a founder you are an investor or the other way around a holistic pitch deck, which has like 10 to 12 slides, which has a problem solution definition, a competitive landscape, what would be your go-to-market approach, your business model, who your team is, all of that. You know, if you can in have all those ingredients, which basically shows that your basic research and your basic thesis is in place. And then if you have started building your product, if you can, uh, you know, holistically give an update about that. Even if it is just, you know, an MVP or idea stage, you can talk about what, how this product will look like or at what stage you are in. And I think the most important slide or most important information for any investor is traction. So to traction for a very early stage startup, uh, idea stage startup is always market validation. How many interviews you have done, how much, uh, you know, how much feedback do you have from the market? Is there a demand for that? And if you have an MVP, have you tested that? What is the uptake of that? Is your pricing working out? And then when, once you launch the product, then how you're going to, you know, going in that in iterative loop and keep building that product. So I think those are uh, the, you know, the, I mean, it's not something that uh, nobody knows, but it's just the process. And I think this process and keeping all these moving parts together for a founder is always very difficult. And I really have a lot of respect for the founders who are able to put it all together and holistically update that. And uh, I would say this is uh, really the baseline 
uh, for me to look into any startup evaluation and how uh, good a founder, how how nicely he or she is able to communicate their journey, their process, how honest they are about their journey. I think that is very, very important. What I found most memorable right now from this interview is the, is uh, investment is a process. So it's not a one-time event, it's a process and it starts way before the investment and it continues way after the investment is just, just my personal experience. And that is something that the Dudash network then takes up. Yes, that's right. So I think that's that's a very valid point. So the the idea is that uh, you provide your information in a structured way, which is accessible to the investors. As founders, you can control what information you are providing to which investor. So you, you can decide when you want to open, how your conversations are going on. And once you update them, the notifications are provided to the investors and, and then they can get in touch with you. You can get in touch with them. And as you release the information, that trust, that, uh, you know, transparency should continue to develop that trust to bring you closer to the investment. And uh, the investors should feel more confident in investing in a particular startup when they see the journey of a startup founder, which is more transparent. And uh, they, that kind of uh, leads to uh, the investment uh, decision. And if the startup founder continues to update, even if uh, investment happens, that only builds trust and subsequent rounds uh, for a startup as well as investor. That's all I can say. And with Udash, of course, the investability platform will enable the entire digital communication in this process. Hmm. I see. So... I would assume only thing left for me to say is for all entrepreneurs who are interested in that, you can go down here in the show notes. There is an option to sign up for Doodash as well as joining our Doodash group of StartupRate.io. <laughs> no more words needed. Everything said. <laughs> yeah, it looks like that. <laughs> People are signing up. <laughs> Great. It was just a pleasure having you here. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll meet again pretty soon. Absolutely, Jan. I'm, I'm uh, really happy to have this uh, discussion with you. And uh, with our community, we basically like to extend also some benefits and perks to the startup community, which we will extend to your community as well. So we have a typical HubSpot for entrepreneurs, HubSpot for startups who've done some fundraising or Freshworks for early stage founders or late stage, depending upon what stage they are. So the credits are decided based on that. And of course, we've also partnered with AWS. So, and there are more uh, coming. So, these are three notable big uh, partners that we have, and we'll be happy to extend that to your community as well. There's no more I have to say about it. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Have a great day. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.